I was just there doing my thing and then next minute I was like blind and I was like, well, what's going on? I don't know what the hell was going on. This is now the beginning of 911. Let's see how far we can take this. When you was in the band, did you have very little control? Was it just very much do as you're told to do? Kind yeah, of? we schedule every day, shoved underneath our hotel door at night. Sometimes we didn't get a chance to eat. Sometimes people really didn't care how much they're working us. People don't like to see people doing well, unfortunately. It just kind of spiraled from there, really. It was just like, I have got a clue, because this is all I've known for five years. I was in a weird state as soon as that happened, to be honest, but it's all good, survived. Lee Brennan, who sold millions of records worldwide, performed to thousands of people, still has that bloody voice in his head. Ooh, it's a naughty one, that man. Okay, I'm super, super happy to have my good friend Lee Brennan joining us on this episode of Successful Lee. It's been like three years since the last episode. Like, where has that time gone? For me, that, that seems like it was only yesterday you was here in person pre the Zoom days. Yeah, it flew by, isn't it? Time does fly, doesn't it? And I think the last couple of years, obviously, from the pandemic, it seems to have just gone even quicker those two years. So, yeah, it's been a while, Matt. It's, it's been a while. Fantastic. And we were, just saying, we were just saying about gigs as well. We need to do some gigs together as well. I think mm. we reckon we've done about four together, but we need to get some more in. Um, but I did do a little bit of research before just to check. It was episode 18 of the Rich in Success podcast, as it was called back then. 18. Was on. Yeah, and, and actually, um, so why I want to say that is just, to say to people, if you haven't already, and even if you have, you need to listen again, um, but check that episode out. It was going on for nearly two hours mm. and Lee opened up and was very, very, very vulnerable, very honest. And we went into some real depth about Lee's childhood, about getting into the band. There were some funny stories um, about when he first met the other members and things like that. And there's so much gold, so much value um, in that episode. So I just want to say, like, my mission for tonight is to sort of not just go over the old ground and to say that let's bring new value, but do still check out that episode if you want to know more about Lee's, um, Lee's story, basically. I'm sure there's lots of you that already know it, but check it out anyway. It was great. So tonight, I want to start a little bit more with kind of the after the boy band life and where we are now. Um, I saw you posted a video last night on social media. So for anybody that's not familiar, there is a new British film over on Netflix called I Used To Be Famous. And it's ultimately talking about what happens next after you're in a super successful boy band, <laughs> something Lee may be familiar with. Um, and Lee last week was interviewed um, along with a few other people. There was like Simon Webb on there, wasn't there? There was Hannah from S Club, Seven. Um, um, Del from Bewitched and Dan Corsi from Northern Line. They were a boy band in the so late it got, it got yeah. me thinking, like watching that video, for you personally being interviewed about, in particular, that time in your life right after the fame ended, as they say. What did that bring up for you, reflecting on that period in your life when you've gone from these kind of, you know, number one chat topping songs, touring the world, people, uh, like concerts having to be stopped because people are getting crushed with all the, the, the mania. When all that stopped initially, what was that journey like for you? Initially, it was kind of a, phew, thank, it was kind of like a thank God moment initially, because um, I didn't really think about the consequences of stopping in that moment. I think it took me a while before that kind of really hit me, the reality of stopping. But in that moment, I was like, oh, I'm going to get a chance to lie in now for the first time in five years. I don't have to travel the world. I hate flying. I'm scared of flying. So it's going to be um, hopefully six months of me lying on my roof. I was living in... Uh, a flat in Kensington um, at the time with my ex, my ex wife, and I just used to get up and lie in the sun. It was, it was like it was heading in towards spring when we first kind of finished, and I just wanted to relax every day, go for walks on the high street, have a coffee, and just really just be chilled and no sound around me, and just just kind of try and reflect on what had happened. But I wasn't aware of 
how much it was going to affect me just yet in that point, really. Do you know what I mean? It took about six months before I really started thinking more about, right, well, I best think about what I'm going to do next then. And that's when the, the problem started to arise that, actually, what can I do next? It's going to, like, potentially top this or match what I've done, as in the buzz, the kind of success, all that kind of thing. And uh, it was a real struggle to, to kind of find, find where to go. So for about two or three years, I literally did nothing apart from kind of get to know my ex-partner a better. That was our kind of thing, really. That's the thing I always think about is getting that success, that fame so early in life. You know, they're the things that get people out of bed a lot of the time, having this ambition and these great goals. I always think if you, if you achieve that so young, there's kind of two things that happen. One is like, oh, I've, I've achieved it all now. So what next? Like, it, it must be hard. I always think like film actors, the very first time you get that first lead role in a huge blockbuster, uh, blockbuster Hollywood movie or whatever, it must be incredible. The feeling, once you're doing three or four movies a year for 30 <clears throat> years, like where do you get that high ever again? And the second thing is, the pressure, like, is there an expectation then, or was there for you, that's kind of like, if I don't do that again, who am I? Am I just a has-been? Am I just a nobody? I think that um, the expectation was all in my head, yeah. I don't think anybody else gave, gave a, a shit, to be honest, about that. Yeah, I was all just in my head thinking, right, okay, I've got to try and do a solo career next and all this kind of thing. And I... To be honest, I didn't realise how lost I was until I kind of, I got a solo deal, I released one song and it did nothing. And I was like, it hit me that, right, I'm going to close the door on this, I'm going to finish this. It's, this isn't what actually I'm, I'm going to end up doing. Um, that's failed. And I guess like, it just kind of spiralled from there really. It was just like, I haven't got a clue because this is all I've known for five years. I don't know how to pay a bill. I don't know what shopping to do because we were fed every single day. I haven't got a schedule so to keep to. I just, I literally did not have a clue. And I think because of that, it used, I slowly started sinking into that real low, low mood every day. And that became a pattern. And it was just repeated for months, years, and it just continued. And we try, I tried different things throughout the next kind of few years. And, um, but yeah, I, I guess once we were out of the industry, it was kind of hard to get <clears throat> back into it. Um, even as a, a solo guy, I guess um, reality shows hadn't really, the amount of reality shows now, there wasn't that many around just after we split up. So there was nothing for me to kind of jump on board to lift my profile up again in order to get something else. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, it was difficult. I wanted to perform still. I, I got an acting, uh, an acting agent for uh, musicals. And I did some musical theatre auditions, but an audition for a musical theatre was a, a new, complete ball game to me. I didn't have a clue how to handle it. I'd never done it before. And the style of songs they were asking me to sing, it just... I hadn't kind of, I didn't have a clue, to be honest. I was literally lost, little boy lost. And for you, it's kind of like you're then becoming an adult. Because let's be honest, you know, you was, you, you was pretty much not much older than a child when the band first started. And I do think, yeah. It, it, so it's kind of like when you're an adult, you're expected to know the simple things like pay a bill and like, you know, how to how to go to the shops and stuff like that. So I just always think that must be from a, a mental standpoint, that's a really tough thing. You're seeing all these other adults that maybe by the time they're in their mid twenties and early thirties are actually at a point where they're finally figuring out who they are and what they want out of life. For you, it was almost the reverse. You'd known who you were to some degree. You'd been somebody. And then it's like the opposite. And I actually think the point I'm trying to make, I guess, is everybody strives for what you had. Like they, they strive for that quick win, that overnight success. And I know it wasn't like, forgive me for saying it was overnight success. There was a lot of hard work. Mm. But that having a lot of young people strive for it. But I suspect that actually what you had to then be at the other end, you know, where you are a little older, and now you really don't know what's next. In many ways, that could be a lot harder. What was it like mentally? And, and sort of, what was the worst it got for you? 
Well, I think just going back, you mentioned something about um, being somebody. I think I was somebody back then, but I didn't have a clue who I was because I was on this treadmill of just the, the, the kind of the job we were doing and stuff. I kind of lost. I don't really know who I was going into the band. I was quite a, I guess I was quite a, quite an introverted uh, guy going into the group and um, a little bit of an unconfident guy. And that got better, I guess, in the group, a little bit better, but I was still kind of a little bit unsure of myself. So I think coming off the back of the band, I realized that in the end, I realized I didn't know who the hell I was. Mm. I was I was somebody in the group, but I didn't actually know who, who I was. So that took, do you know what, that's probably taken me just a lot of work, probably a decade of work of, you know, I think, and the, the real work started probably a couple of years after we finished, just kind of going to counseling, um, different therapy. Um, I decided to get out of the house every single day and just walk a couple of miles into Richmond, um, just to kind of try and clear my head and get my thoughts in the right place for that day. I was focusing on each day, to be honest, at the time. And um, the lowest it probably got was I just, I developed this, and I think I developed it during the group, actually. I did have a... I was kind of a bit of an obsession with how I looked, not in a vanity way, just in a real, a, a negative psychological way, to be honest. Real, real issues. And um, there was lots of little rituals I used to do. I won't go into them because to me, it's, um, it's, kind of, it's kind of weird, some of the stuff I did. like. But I used to be obsessed with like, I thought I was aging every single day by about a year. I was just completely gone in my head of how I saw myself. Um, and it's kind of weird and no matter what everybody said anyone might say to me like hey you look great for your age you look she's so young for your age that doesn't mean anything to you if it's in your head you're telling yourself complete opposite of that so I was really like battering myself with <clears throat> excuse me with uh, really bad words just sabotaging myself every day so the worst it got was I can say it started to change when I looked in the mirror one day and I decided that I've had enough of me scrutinizing myself in this real bad way and that was when I, I i remember looking in the mirror at the end go like this has to effing stop like this has to stop or else i'm gonna send myself crazy like and uh so i just decided there to, to kind of start working on myself therapy reading everything everything i could think of and i'm quite a thinker anyway and I, I like to kind of work stuff out myself so i did a bit of that as well and and yeah just trying to get my mindset in the right place where do you think that came from that level of scrutiny where do you know what the catalyst was yeah again we, i think we, we touched on this last time we spoke together a few years ago but it goes back to my childhood so i had cancer when i was nine and 15 and i think it was the the fact of losing your hair twice and being kind of viewed by people people looking at you and um obviously school kids would would say nasty things as they do we are you know that's what kids that's what kids do when they're at school. They say things they don't realise and understand what they're actually saying and any consequence behind that when they're that young. So it was all of that. So I think psychologically that was already in there and it just needed tapped into again. And then it was going to come out and be an issue as an adult. And when I got in the in the band, um, I, hadn't, I hadn't looked into all those issues from when I was nine and 15. So that escalated with pictures in magazines and people taking pictures and fans criticising, not fans, but other fans of different bands, they, they all had these kind of um, battles against each other, all the, 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 fan, the, the band's fans. So you get some of the other ba fans of bands, rhymes that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, putting, saying things now just like, wow, okay, that's a strange thing to say to me. Like, I was like, God, you look absolutely knackered, mate. What's going on? I'm like, I've just like slept for three hours for the last two years. Like, that's probably a reason why. But I used to really take it in, take it to heart and take it personally. Um, and I think that's escalated after the group as well. I just got worse and worse thinking, yeah, God, I am that, I, I am that weird. So you spoke there about how you got to that point where you're like, enough was enough. And you mentioned things like therapy. Would you talk us through what that process was like and what you got out of therapy? And also give us kind of, from your experience, what were some of the key pieces of advice you would give to somebody if they are in that place where they've got low self-esteem and maybe low confidence and what you did to help you out of that period? Well, do you know, just going back to when we we're in the band, there was no kind of like, there wasn't really a um, kind of a care as such for the well-being of band members and stuff. And I'm sure that must be in place somewhere now when you're with labels and stuff like that, because, you know, mental health is is more out there 
than ever, I think, you know, back then when we were doing our stuff, it wasn't spoken about as, as much as it is now. And I think it's great that it's spoken about so much now. So there wasn't any kind of real help back then. So I was just uh, given this lady's, this lady's number by our tour manager back in, I think it was 2002 or something like that. And uh, so I just decided to pay her a visit and we started chatting. And before I knew it, it, it wasn't just about how I viewed myself, but there was loads of other stuff. Um, you know, we, we all take on board stuff from when we're growing up, don't we? Whether it's um, family stuff, whether it's work stuff, whether it's friends, whether it's partners. There's so much stuff that we take in and then we decide how we're going to be ourselves based on all those kind of things, I guess, and other things, the world, basically. So it was just about picking through. I think every session I went into, I tried to overthink what I'm, what I'm going to talk about today. But before you know it, the hour is finished and you've talked in so, so much depth about one subject, whether it could be family, whether it could be um, how you see yourself, how you take care, how, how you speak to yourself each day. And we just slowly went through these um, steps over months and months, really. I just wanted to keep going as long as I could to learn, 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 and learn, basically. And, um, but I guess for advice for people is like, yeah, that, the best thing, isn't it? And it's always said that we just have to, it's okay to speak up. It just, it's, it's good to speak to somebody. We may not, there might be a voice telling us in our head, no, no, don't, don't go bothering people with that. But actually people want to help you. So the more we can kind of try and be vulnerable and, and I guess people will say it's brave, just speak up. That's, that's definitely the biggest thing I think, because we know it's hard to see the end goal but well, actually, if we can think like for a second that, do you know what, if I do this, there's going to be more light coming my way at the end of the, uh, the end of this little journey, however long that is. And I think that's a good thing to speak, speak up. It's, and I know it's difficult for people. It really is like, especially men, you know, I think especially men. But just begin, just start. Then first few words, just start. That's it, you know. What about now with regards to self-care and looking after your mental health? and physical health, do you have any kind of go-to daily rituals or weekly habits, things that you kind of are non-negotiable for you that you know when I tick these boxes, when I do these things, these are really great for me? I do, every morning I get up, I jump on the side of my bed and I say a little kind of affirmation to myself and, it, and I make my bed, there's a, there's a you, you will know this, there's a, there's a, I think it's a Royal Navy kind of journal or something, uh, guy and it's on youtube this and he talks about how important it is to make your bed every day because it's the first task of the day and it can really kind of give you a i've accomplished my first task of the day and it can just do something you don't have to overthink it just do it but i jump uh, my alarm goes off i jump on the side of my bed i say something to myself every day and um and it kind of gives me a quick like energy boost because of what i say and then i make my bed and i'm like cool and then i go and flick the kettle on um, so those little, that's my first kind of little ritual and those habits. And um, sometimes when I'm away, because I'm not in my own space, like I just, I forget to do stuff. I'm like, oh, I forgot to do that today. But I'll try and do it the next day if I'm away as well. But uh, I think as well, just I definitely get out more walking than I've ever done in my life before. I used to never walk. I used to just drive everywhere. Um, and I think the, the pandemic, the lockdowns, and when, you know, we got out to walk and stuff like that, I started doing that with my mum. And I realised this is such a great, great thing that I, I'd never thought of doing before. And that's something I, I do as much as I can do. Um, and I don't kind of set any real targets. I don't put pressure on myself to do, but well, I have to hit 15,000 or 10,000 or 5,000 steps today. I just move. And it's what I tell people in my coaching, uh, nutrition and fitness stuff now. I tell people, just move more, move your body. If you're on the phone in your house, you're flat, get up and walk around. You know, just move your body. Be aware that you need to move more. And walking in is included in that. And I think I do, um, you know, I try and get a few work, three workouts a week is kind of my, what I like to do. Um, again, I don't always hit that. I don't put pressure on myself. I go, do you know what? Didn't accomplish that this week. That's okay, because we've got another week to go. I can start again and try that, try for those three workouts this next week as well. I try and just remove pressure. And if I feel really stressed with things, I'll just like, I try and make my life as easy as possible. Like, and um. I really do. I just try and make everything as simple as possible. If it means, um, I don't know, getting a second shopping bag so I can 
have two carrier bags balancing them out on, <laughs> when I'm walking home or something like that. I, stuff like that. I, I am quite like, yeah. I just try and make my life easy, man. The best I can. Let's talk a little bit about fame because I know this kind of idea of this film is I used to be famous. But the mm. reality is you are still well known, you know, around the world, different countries. I think we can all, even those of us that are not famous, I think it's pretty clear for us all to see that fame isn't that thing that we all assume it's going to be. You know, fame generally, as much as it got lots of upsides, it's more people knowing who you are, which is more people judging everything you do, more expectation, more pressure, right? Because you've got record labels and so on that want you to do certain things. For you on reflection now, if you could choose between living your life as somebody who's well known and not being famous, would you still pick the fame? If I could do a job that I loved and got passion for, passionate about, I'd happily do it without what I knew was fame back then. Yeah, if I, could, if I knew I was really, really enjoying my job and I was passionate about it. Um, but when you're young, I don't know. I think I saw the likes to take that and Bross and Yukis on the block. And I was like, I would love to do something like that. So it's a, that's a difficult question, like it really is. But I know that I want to, now I know what I know about myself and what I like, what I don't like, and what I've done uh, with 911. I think it's all about me enjoying what I'm doing, really enjoying what I'm doing, and uh, yeah, taking away as much kind of any overwhelm and stress from my life as I possibly can. And it's everyone's got stresses every day and all that, but it's just I, I tr really try and that because that works for me for my self care basically. I just think, I think what you've, you've answered there, and, and really, thank you for answering that honestly, because it'd be so easy to go, um, yes, I mean, I wouldn't change it for the world and give that kind of politically correct answer. But I think it's, it's so important for people to hear that answer you've given, simply because we're living in a world now where the metric for living a successful life is, for so many people, how many followers do you have on Instagram? How many likes did that post get? It is still mm. searching for fame, whether it being in a boy band or not. People are looking for that metric. And I think it's such a toxic, damaging thing to chase. And here's somebody that's had all that in abundance saying, really? As much as there is upsides? And as you know, there's, we can't dispute there's advantages to it. That really, deep down, the negatives outweigh those advantages. Um, so yeah, thank you for that, Lee. I think that's really important. On that, a question I always like to ask guests is as you reflect over your life, what would you say have been some of your biggest quote unquote failures? And what were the lessons you learned from them? Well, I think I've learned that it's okay to fail and failure, I think, uh, to get, I think, when we, to get anywhere you want to you want to be, whether it's a health and fitness journey, whether it's your career, whatever it is, we're we're, we're gonna. It's good to try and accept and acknowledge that and understand that we are going to fail as we go forward to try and build that success wherever it may be. And I think um, a lot of people think um, the first failure. Well, I'm not gonna. I can't do this then. I'm not not good enough. It's never going to happen. But we have to kind of see past that and just see it as it's one of them hurdles we jump. See it as a hurdle, jump it and go to the next one. And it will, most people, I guess like, you'll know this is as, because you are a top coach. You'll know from the people that you, who you look up to as well, that um, they have had so many top, top people in the world, coaches and stuff. They have had ultimately loads of failures before they've got to where they are now. And it's, I think, I think it's good to, it's, not, it's good to understand that it's okay to fail like, do you know what I mean? It really is. Even like when I did my first coaching thing, it took me a while to actually do my first one and kind of launch the business because I was so, this little voice on one side, isn't it? It was going, you're going to fail, mate. You're going to say the wrong thing. You're going to look an absolute whatever. And you wonder what you're talking about. And then you got this voice going, no, no, it's all good. It's all good. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm talking about. I've learned lots of good stuff. So it's just a case of overriding that, those thoughts because, Failure is a part of life in many little things, but it doesn't mean we have failed, I think, you know. 
I think we've all just got to appreciate for a moment that Lee Brennan, who sold millions of records worldwide, performed to thousands of people, still has that bloody voice in his head saying, Absolutely. you're going to look an idiot, you're going to get it wrong. And I just think that, and also, you're so right. I think some of the most, what we deem <clears> as being <throat> successful people in the world will often say, not only have they feel, failed a lot, but they failed on a grand scale. Like, I believe it was Steve jobs with apple he actually got sacked from apple like he sold shares or something to somebody else and the person he brought on got rid of him that's a true story google it i don't know all the ins and outs obviously but like we just see steve jobs and this huge apple and this company but actually that was a huge failure he went away and worked on something else and then came back with more clout and re-bought his position um i think the other one i was thinking of is jk rowling she speaks yeah about- Big time. There's a beautiful quote that I talk about a lot where she failed on a great scale. And um, she says something along the lines of failure is something you cannot avoid in life unless you live life so cautiously that you never do anything and therefore you fail by default. And I, oh, yeah, I just I love, love that. that quote. So, yeah, I think that's... love that. Yeah, yeah. I really like that. And it's, it's so true, isn't it? I think um, it's okay to, like perceived failure it's okay because we, we always learn something from that don't we? we get that feedback of okay well let's continue but what feedback have i got what have i learned from that not working so let's adjust things let's add that new knowledge i've got and then let's go forward and see what happens and stuff and just keep going i think like don't stop don't stop that's that's one thing i don't don't stop like you know love it so before we started recording earlier on you said to me when we was reflecting on um, when we'd last met up and the last podcast we did, which was three years ago, you said a lot has actually changed in those three years. What did you mean by that? I think um, all the lockdowns and stuff gave everyone an opportunity to assess their life, where they're at, what's important, maybe what's not so important, what, I don't know, you know, how... Um, what do I want to do in my own life? Um, should I put more effort into this part of my life? Should I take away that from my life? I, I think many people had these kind of um, outlooks of just, just have lots of different um, thoughts about what's important now going forward. And I think that's what's changed. Um, I think I probably, I think I used to tolerate things and maybe people uh, a lot I've got a high kind of tolerance threshold I think like you know what I mean um but I think doing all that work during the lockdowns and stuff looking at things in my life what can I do to make things a bit maybe easier for me or all that kind of stuff I think I learned that you don't have to tolerate everybody because I think sometimes there's um behavior maybe that's aimed towards you stuff like that and it's okay to go, do you know what, I, I'm not putting up with that. And I would have done that in the past. I think I would have tolerated certain things. And um, it's stuff like that, I think. I've just kind of, I've learned how to build barriers. I, I've been a people pleaser all my life. And I still enjoy doing that and helping people. But I've also learned now during this last few years that it's okay to put a barrier there and go, um, no. I, it's okay to say no. Or it's okay to kind of let some, tell somebody that, if they're overstepping the mark with you and trying to kind of, I don't know, whatever it is, it's okay to kind of have a barrier and go, sorry, no, that's not happening. And I've, I used to struggle with with saying those kind of things to people and in general, and whether that's business or, you know, um, partners, friends, family, whatever it is, I, I feel I've got more confidence to speak in that way. And that's not me being, I don't be horrible to people. It's just um, I've got confidence to put a little barrier in place now if I need to look after myself. And I think that's, the biggest thing I can take away from the last few years, definitely. I've got an observation here. Do you want to hear it or should I keep it to myself? <laughs> uh, no, yeah. I, love, I want to hear it. What you've just said there now makes so much sense to me because one thing I can observe about you compared to just three years ago is you are so much more <laughs> self-assured just when you speak. Just as simple as talking on this tonight, you can see the way you hold yourself, the way that you're speaking now. And it just got me thinking as you were speaking, I feel like, and as we all are, we go through all these experiences in life and this shapes 
how we conduct ourselves and that people pleasing need. When you was in the band, did you have very little control? Was it just very much do as do as you we, you're told to do kind of thing? Yeah, we schedule every day, shoved underneath our hotel door at night, and we'd read it like, right, okay, gotta be up four tomorrow, then we're flying to so and so, flying here. We were just like, because we knew we were gonna get um, collected and flew off somewhere, or there's a photo shoot. We knew everything was in place anyway for for our to do our for us to be able to do our job. Um, so yeah, it was just it was yeah, all kind of controlled and even down to when sometimes we didn't get a chance to eat. But in the end, we started putting those kind of things in place. Like we, we need to stop and eat half an hour at least. We need to eat because uh, it just became about you're on that constant wheel of just work, 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 work because. You know, I think uh, sometimes people really didn't care how much they work on us. Um, that was our job. But we obviously, in the end, decided that, you know, we need to eat and we need to put some boundaries in place. And, and then there's the, guilt, there's the guilt and the pressure, I guess. Of, yeah, but you're so lucky, you're so privileged. And then that, and I just think what you're saying there about that, being told what to do, being controlled, plus naturally being a people pleaser, mm. that's kind of like a recipe <laughs> for self-doubt. And it's a recipe for anxiety and maybe losing your voice, which is ironic since you're a singer. But the reason I say that is I, I genuinely want to commend you here on this podcast and also as a friend, really, just to say you can tell when someone's genuinely done the work and when someone's chatting BS. Mm -hmm. And you can see that there's been a huge, you know, this is why I wanted to ask you the question when you said it earlier, that a lot has changed in three years. You didn't go into depth. And I had a sneaky suspicion. It's, you've really changed how you feel about yourself, that you've got boundaries, as you say. And you're now more, would you say you're more sort of self-assured than you've ever been? Oh, difficult one. I think I'm, I'm more... I kind of put, I always push myself to like the thought of doing lives, like in lockdown, for instance, I got, I was always asked to do lives on Instagram. I did one in the two years of lockdown because I just cringed at myself being on a camera. So it shows now I'm so much more comfortable just standing here speaking on camera. And it's weird because, yeah, there's this kind of pull and push thing sometimes that, um, again, it's all about, we have these little voices, don't we, telling us, nah, you know, <laughs> you can't. And you think you can be good at this, but you're not good at it really. All this kind of stuff going on. I'm self-assured as in, um, I'm more, um, I, don't, I always forget this word. I'm not scared to, to, to kind of say something as in, not, not um, again, be, not being horrible, just saying something rather than just not saying something like I used to do and stuff like that. And I think, uh, yeah, where was I going with that one? I don't know. I'm a self-assured. In some things, it's funny because only a few weeks ago, I was just saying to somebody like, when I when I kind of walk out my apartment and stuff, I'm quite, I feel quite self-conscious and a bit shy when I walk around. It's weird, but I'm aware of it. And that's, I think that's a good thing. That I'm aware of it. Yeah. And uh, awareness is everything, right? Because yeah. if you're not aware, it can control you. If you are aware, you can kind of manage it better, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm, I'm trying to, still trying to decide if it's, because I live in my hometown, I feel a bit more self-conscious. I think there's something in that um because when i'm in london or manchester i don't it doesn't even cross my mind so maybe it's something to do in my hometown and there was a lot of negative experiences when i was in the group in my hometown as well and that's probably all well actually yeah it's just that's just hit me there it's all to do with that obviously in it so yeah and i think that would be the same for most people where you know the really informative years you don't always know what you want to do in your life a lot of people you know in your position you've broken the mould of what most people around you are doing. And that's then going to create, from some people, unfortunately, resentment. People don't like to see people doing well, unfortunately. It's just a reality. Yeah. And if you're a people pleaser, going into a place where you know there'll be people that are jealous, you know, as much as it's your hometown and there's people that love you there, at the same time, it makes sense that you might be more self-conscious there. Yeah. Well, do you know what? Then I look at, then I go into like, if I go out, I mean, I don't go out too much in Cala anyway, but there's certain events I go to and certain nights out and stuff, which are great. And the, so the the actual, if I look at the uh, facts now, it's always fine. 
So it's just, again, it's, it's a thing that's in my head, but... In your head, yeah. And then that's the thing, come back to evidence. And it's like, yeah. I'm sure nine times out of ten, everyone you meet says really lovely things. It is, it is absolutely fine, yeah. Apart from I got a drink thrown in my face on stage of the day, someone on the front row, some guy, and he got, yeah. I'd, random, first time ever in my life a drink's been thrown in my face. I don't know what the hell it was. <laughs> Mad, but yeah. Was that at Butlins? It's got to be at Butlins, or was that in your hometown? No, it was um, it was Coventry, actually. It was just the gig we are doing with these 17 and 5, and I was just there doing my thing, and then next minute I was, like, blinded, and I was like, what, what's going on? I don't know what the hell was going on. And, yeah, it was uh, it was somebody come right to the front, and the, the barrier was right next to the stage, and I was I went to the front of the stage, and I was just kind of performing, and then all of a sudden this goes, thing goes all over me, and I didn't know what the heck was going on, but um, apparently it was a guy that just... There was only about five guys in the whole crowd yeah. so don't get it me like but stuff like that like freaked me out i was i was in a weird state as soon as that happened to be honest but it's all good survived i want you to talk about your journey to becoming a fitness instructor because obviously that's a, a relatively recent thing and it's something that appears to be doing absolutely amazing it's kind of like a new passion of yours i guess isn't it right that that you've you've sort of embarked on yeah, so back, if I can rewind to 2010, so when I'd done a lot of my kind of counselling and trying to get myself in a better place uh, mentally, um, I'd saw this, I'd, I'd tried, kind of, I'd done like photography, I'd had a stage school, I'd done loads of these different things just to try and give me a focus of where I wanted to go in my life. And um, through all the counselling stuff, I thought, I really like this. And I, I kind of enjoyed listening to other people's kind of stuff that they wanted to get off their chest when I was with them. So I was like, I'm going to do that three month, um, you know, level two, I think it was basic counseling skills course and see what it's like, because I, I thought I want to be a, um, a counselor. It's funny because when I was ill, when I was younger, I, I wanted to be a doctor. I was getting helped off people. So then I wanted to help others and me getting help off the counselor. Then I was like, well, I want to help others. And that's how it usually works, I guess. We're inspired by different things all the time, aren't we? So I decided to, um, I studied counselling and I really loved it. I learned a lot of stuff and I put a lot of stuff into practice from my friends and family when I spoke to them, just little things I'd learned, some of the skills. And um, so fast forward to lockdown, I was like, what can I do? Um, I want to learn something. I want to learn something new. So I was like, well, I've had to always keep kind of as fit as I can for my job, performing job. So I was, thinking, I was like, my mate owns a gym in Carlisle. I was like, um, maybe I'll start an online kind of um, coaching. I didn't have a clue where it would go. Like we never do that when we start something, we just kind of think that I'll start it and see what happens after that. So I spent lots of time getting um, my level three PT. Um, I did all those exams, uh, went in the gym and stuff and had to do lots of different things in the gym to get assessed. And then I did um, uh, an amazing... Uh, precision nutrition um, coaching uh, certificate and it was amazing it was such a great one it's about um, behavior and stuff like that and I'm, I'm really I've been obsessed with like psychology behavior and all that kind of stuff the words we speak I've been obsessed with all that for many many years me um, so I did all that and then I was like right well I'm, I'm going to put this coaching business together now and I, but I want it to come from a, a place of um, I'd learned a lot of the counsellors I'd seen lots of compassion and empathy and that's the approach I, I kind of I take with people I, I try and give that to people anyway and that's the that's the approach I decided straight away I want this approach um I don't want to be a I'm not I'm not a, I don't want to be known as a PT anyway I'm just an online kind of coach nutrition and fitness coach and mindset coach I guess and uh I, wanted, I didn't want to be known as like a finger pointing coach saying, well, if you don't do that, yeah, shit. And if you don't do that, well, what's the point you're doing this? Ah, I didn't want to shout. I'm not that kind of person anyway. But I thought, well, that, will it work just me being myself and trying to show compassion to people? Like, because that's the way I, I deal with, with people. Um, I try to deal with people every day like that. Uh, and understanding is a huge thing, I think. So I just thought I'm going to do it. and I'm going to call it. Mr. Body Shaper is the name. I've all, my social media has always been Mr. Lee Brennan through the years. So I was like, well, I had a song called Body Shaking. Let's be Mr. Body Shaper. That makes sense. So I was like, let's do that. And then I came up with a Happy Healthy Strong program. And 
um, I had to think what kind of, you know, what's my audience? What am I looking at? And I thought, well, you know, um, it's, my, well, it's a hundred percent so far out of 120 clients that I've, that I've got um, over 30, kind of 35 plus women. That is, that is the audience, you know? And, um, and it was for people who have struggled with uh, yo-yo dieting, fad diets, um, a, lo a lot of, I've had a lot of people talking about these kind of fat clubs that they've been to in the past and how damaging it's been to their, their mental health and stuff like that. And they've, they've picked up a lot of bad habits and it's just a beginner's, a beginner's program for four weeks to really give them uh, the basic knowledge, how to then take their kind of fitness, health and fitness journey forward. So, and I absolutely love it and I'm still learning loads, but yeah, and I've learned loads during the last two kind of sessions as well. What have you found are some of the common themes where people have been kind of going wrong with their, you, you mentioned their yo-yo diet in, what are the, what are the reasons, what are the catalysts that you've found why people do it? And what have been some of the solutions to help people get on a little bit more of a sustainable path with their health and their nutrition? I think a lot of people, um, they, aren't, they don't have the basic knowledge. So they're kind of, a lot of these, a lot of these clubs, what I've learned is a lot of these clubs, they're big businesses, aren't they? So they want repeat customers. So they, there's a gap between a client and the person who's um, kind of owns a business. There's a massive gap in the middle and that's all the knowledge. And a lot of them skip that and they just want the money from the clients that keeps them going back. So they never get the full knowledge and they, they kind of confuse people. I think a lot of the time with the way they talk about nutrition and fitness. And um, I don't think they put a lot of the basics in place and the mindset things, maybe the words, maybe the, how they view exercise, how they view food, how they view themselves. Because I think the, the, the main thing as, as you know as well, and we have to get our mindset in the, in the right place in order to um, achieve what we want to achieve with goals. Because if we haven't got the mindset in the right place, a lot of the time we quit after a very short period because it overwhelms us. We try and do seven workouts a week. We try and do, we try and chop out food groups, stop eating chocolate, stop eating this, cut out alcohol. We try and do everything. And this is what people are used to. And they think that's what they have to do. But actually they don't have to do that. And I'm trying to just give that basic knowledge, the truth about this is what you have to do. Just do it, repeat these steps and eventually you will get there because consistency is what is what gonna what's gonna get you there in the end. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I love just kind of giving that little bit of knowledge to people and the feedback I've had from the program and stuff is has been amazing, like incredible, and that just fulfill that fulfills why I wanted to do it. Basically, it gives me a buzz. I love that, and I think you're so right. I think you've touched upon a point there that I just want to highlight to make sure people listening are kind of aware of because it's it's one of the oldest tricks in the business book is like if you want to for example if you want to do a webinar that's free and then upsell something expensive you want to highlight a problem you want to give a little bit of information about where people are going wrong and what they need to do about it but then you don't tell people the actual information of the how in depth and if mm. you're missing that bit, and I think that's what a lot of these business models do, you know, it's just like, eat these foods, don't eat these, get weird everywhere. And you're like, but why am I doing it? And I don't have the knowledge to understand how to do this without you. So I think, you know, we need more people like you speaking nice and loud, using your voice to say, listen, actually fat loss, health, fitness is all pretty simple. But if you don't know those simple basics and you're not, educated on it it can seem so complex because all these businesses are going to use crazy wording and so on what do you think one of like the main things that most people are unaware of that you kind of educate them on that's like a bit of a aha moment when it comes to like whether it be mindset or whether it be nutrition i think well i give them that the basic understanding of calories and what calorie is and it's you know it's just energy and food and an apple or a donut, it's just energy. It's just food. One's got one's got more calories than the other. One's more nutritious than the other. And it's just about, um, you know, uh, four parts of metabolism that we have. 
Um, I get people to understand about the calories and food is just food. I try and remove that overwhelm of people thinking it's good or it's bad. It's just food. If we can see it, it's just food. Some are high calories, some are low calories, some are more nutritious, some are not so nutritious, but it's okay to eat all foods. But saying that, if you're on a fat loss journey, you have to um, have smaller portions, but find your calorie maintenance and then we'll get you in a calorie deficit. Just all these, I, I, I do love kind of, I love it when people say, oh my God, I didn't know that. And it amazes me because I didn't know it either. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize all that kind of stuff. But when I, because I, all the knowledge that I, before I started the business, I tried it out myself just to understand it all. Like I, I tried, I tried just doing nutrition with no exercise for about six, eight weeks just to see, wow, well, right. And it works. So, but this is what I tell people. I say to people three things. I always say, right, nutrition, think about it like this. Number one, nutrition for fat loss. Focus on nutrition. That'll take care of your fat loss. Cardio will look after your heart health as well as other benefits. Lifting weights will get you stronger and build some muscle. Get that toned look. Those three things, do you know what I mean? And then um, I just get people to track their, be as consistent as possible with their calorie deficit, their steps and their protein target. Those three things, you repeat those consistently and you will begin to reach your goals. And then you can add your workouts, whatever you love, whether it's doing box exercise, cycling, swimming, uh, doing your Zumba class. I'll encourage people to lift weights for many benefits. But a lot of people have found, uh, the ladies that I am coaching, another lot, bit of feedback I found was a lot of people, they love chasing the feeling, the feel good feeling. So a lot of that is doing lots of cardio stuff. Very quickly, you get that feeling. And that is the feedback I'm getting. So I'm, I'm trying to educate people on, um, I do like beginner's dumbbell sessions. I, I do like a technique and a form. And then we put a workout together, lifting dumbbells, a basic workout um, that they can then add heavier weights if they want to continue it. But a lot of them, they just love doing cardio, no matter how much I say. But I'm trying to kind of get, into, okay, let's do some dumbbells and cardio then. We'll mix and match it. So yeah, it's just all those basic things and uh, switching the mindset also. I am rambling, but tell me to stop if you want me to. But um, it's also about seeing exercise as something that takes care of our well-being, our strength, our bones, our movement, our muscle, everything like that. See it as that rather than seeing it as you're going to burn some calories today. Because so many people, all they focus on when you think about weight loss, right, treadmill, two hours a day for seven days a week. And it's like, we need to stop seeing exercise as to burn calories it's a, such a negative mindset switch it across for all the benefits that's why you're doing it don't do it if that's not why you're doing it i so mean I'm that's such such a powerful point because it's like also you can get obsessive and then be like underwear it's like when does it stop if the the relationship with exercise is just burn calories burn calories burn, that can become yeah. like so toxic i think what i'm much just healthier, nicer relationship to have to go, this is looking after my body. This is good for my well-being. It's good for my mood. It's good for so many things. And it should just be a habit, just part of like brushing your teeth. It's just something I do on a regular basis. Every single week, I just tick it off. Like if people can get that, even if it's just that one point from this episode and they take that forward. If up until today, your relationship with exercise was burn fat, burn fat. If, if that shifts after today, that's a huge, powerful shift to have. Lee, you're an absolute star. Um, thank you so much. You've shared so much already tonight. I just Thanks, want to come on to our last couple of questions before we finish off. Um, before we do that, if people want to know more about what you do and maybe get involved, do you want to just tell people where they need to look and how they can get in touch with you? Uh, just jump on my Instagram is, is what I kind of use the most. So either at Mr. Lee Brennan or at Mr. Body Shaper. And uh, yeah, you can jump on there, send me a message or whatever. Brilliant. Hit Lee up. Absolutely amazing. Lee, final couple of questions just before we close. As this is successful, my mission here is basically to help people learn the things that traditional education perhaps never taught them, but absolutely should have done. I want to know if you look back your time in traditional education, what were the three lessons that you never learned, but you've learned from life that you think are super important for people? 
I think it would be good to learn more about well-being at schools, definitely, um, and how to kind of, you know, take care of you yourself when you're going through difficult times, maybe. Just a bit of guidance with that kind of thing. Um, money, more about money, I think, would be, would be a great thing at school. Um, I, used to, I remember I used to panic at the thought of what a credit card was when I was at school. I, I don't know what to do with that. I, just, I don't know why. Just, some of the things that used to go through my head when I was at school was like, how do you do that with the house? How do you get a credit card? You should drive me mad. And I think uh, third one, I think for me, it's all, it's all got to do with well-being stuff. So I think um, more education on, on kind of nutrition and fitness maybe as well. I know we did PE and all that kind of stuff, but I don't know, just a bit more knowledge of that would, would be kind of good. Little basic things. I think basic things for those three things would really help people. And that's kind of, they're the sort of things you and I, and I know a lot of people in this community as well, as well that's something that what you have to do is self-education on that. And it's an ongoing thing as well. And I think, so that's why it's really important joining things like what you're doing, Lee, um, and obviously what we're doing here at Success School is getting around these conversations and learning about those things. Uh, because as far as I'm aware, all those things you just mentioned there, they're still not really on the agenda at school. Like, and No, I don't get it. I don't get it. It seems like a madness. Um, but anyway, Lee, thank you so much. Before we finish, you may remember our closing tradition, or you may not. Um, and I'll be interested if you can remember what you said last time. And... Oh, if, if it's changed, which, by the way, guests that I've had on multiple times, their answer does change. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Um, but final question of this podcast is, Lee, what is your definition of success? My de I better give a different answer a few years back to you, actually. My definition of success is, ooh, it's a naughty one, that much. <laughs> Definition of success. I think inspiring people. Definitely. Yeah, that's what I've come to recognise. What I think more again, more so over the last three, three years, I get I got so many messages during lockdowns and stuff like that from um, fans from back in the day, and I'll, the amount of messages I got saying how you know certain things whether it's songs or us, inspired them to either do something or get themselves out of a, a place that was a really bad place for them, how that helped them. I think that's what's changed. And even now, I still get messages from people. There's a girl two weeks ago who came up to me at um, a crazy 90s weekend at Butlins, and she um, came up to me and said, um, you, you won't know this, but she said, when I was 14, I was, on, I was doing drugs, and I was so in such in a bad place, I was ready to commit suicide. She said, uh, I wrote to the fan club, 911 fan club, and you wrote back to me, you wrote a letter to kind of, you know, hold your head high and do this and, and you know, you've you, you got so much to live for, that kind of thing. And I met her and she was like, I think she was 40 now, 41. And um, that kind of thing, and that kind of, yeah, that's the reason why I think fame is now looking back, that's, it's about inspiring and it shows that you can kind of help and change people. And that's still what hopefully uh, try and do today, you know. It's all about that. I'm inspired by people every day. So just got to try our best and, and do that. Lee, I think anyone that's listened or watched this night will agree. You're a genuine person. You've got a heart of gold. And just thank you for being vulnerable, for being honest, for being an open book once again. It's been an amazing episode and I'm really, really grateful. Thank you, Lee. Love it, Matt. You're doing good things. Thanks, mate. Take it easy. Thanks, everyone. And that is not the end of this interview because Lee actually stayed around for an additional 30 minutes speaking with the members of our community over in the membership, answering personal questions that people put to him. Here is a little preview of the rest of that conversation. Um, it's obvious that you're passionate about what you're doing now, but is, is there anything that you wish that you knew sooner? Well, I noticed today on Instagram, you put up your happy place. Have you always had a happy place or is that just new? Um, so I just wanted to ask when you were saying about um, when you had something on one shoulder saying, oh, you can't do it. What then made you just do it? 
like what was it you mentioned it earlier about the the drink being thrown at you and things like that uh, which is terrible unreal so how do you kind of the question is how do you deal with hate and and negativity for example i imagine you might still get it uh, potentially online and back in the past so between then and now how do you deal with the hate and the negativity um, that's all i wanted to say really it wasn't so much a question as just to say thank you because you actually doing that podcast with matt at that time i didn't know who matt was or anything it made me then discover matt and i've worked with him for the last three years and it's completely Amen. changed my life I so it's like when you said your definite de definition of success is to inspire people like that is what you're doing. When when eyes are on you, how do you not sort of overthink about like, well, if I say that, that's going to affect my demographic of people that are watching or um, not reflecting personal opinions and stuff like that. Now, if you want to listen to the rest of this interview, all you have to do is sign up to become a member of our Success School membership. And if you're not already, why not? You absolutely bloody should be anyway. Um, it is free to join at the time of recording. So you can join us now and continue listening to the rest of this interview um, because you can start a free trial for two weeks. So you've got 14 days access and that will give you access to not just this interview, but all the full members only interviews, as well as all the content we've got in there around personal development, health, well-being, business, mindset, all that kind of stuff. You'll also get access to my private WhatsApp group. So come and join us in there. And if after the two weeks you're like, Mark, this is fantastic. This is is great then to stay a member it's only 19 pounds per month for, so for less than 20 quid a month you can not only be going through all this content be part of our accountability private whatsapp group but also the other thing i should say actually is all our future guests and future interviews you will get the opportunity to be on those podcast recordings live on zoom and be there for the members only q a so you could find yourself chatting to the next guests the, the guests that are coming up over the coming weeks and months ahead so click the link right now do it don't just listen and think oh that sounds good actually click the link it is there in the show notes right now click the link it'll literally take you probably about a minute to sign up if that just to be clear you will be asked to put your payment details in just so that you set a proper account up on our system but you will not be charged anything today that will literally just um create your profile and you can then start your free trial for 14 days. If you don't cancel, if you're happy and you like it, then after 14 days, it starts to become just £19 per month to stay a member. But you've nothing to pay today. Come and join us. Listen to the rest of that interview with Lee and come and join the community. And it really is a fantastic community that I'm so proud of. The people in there, you know, the mindset is great. People are just focused on being the best version of themselves and doing some great things. Um, so it's a great community to be a part of. Whatever you do next, whether you join our membership or not, I really hope you found this a valuable watch or listen if you're listening on audio. Thank you so much for giving me your time today. Um, don't forget, make sure if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast so that you can be there um, continuing this journey with us, listening to our upcoming episodes and guests. Everything about this podcast is designed to help you. That is it. That is what this is about. It is designed to help you live a happier, a healthier, a more fulfilling and a more successful life. So I hope you will stay on this journey with us, whether that be subscribing to the podcast or joining us in the membership. But either way, I hope to see you soon. And I will end this podcast as I always do with the quote from famous thought leader, Mr. Jim Rowan. He said that traditional education will make you a living, but self-education will make you a fortune. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.